Welcome to Healthcare Workflow Process Improvement, Acquiring Clinical Process Knowledge, Lecture A. Objectives for this lecture are to identify how these strategic goals and stakeholders for a given healthcare facility can influence workflow processes in that facility, compare and contrast different types of knowledge and their impact on organizations, and analyze a healthcare scenario according to CMMI levels. Before you attempt to set things right, make sure you see things right. Blaine Lee. This quote gets at the heart of knowledge acquisition. It means that we must understand a process before we attempt to change it. Knowledge acquisition is the necessary step of gathering information. In our case, that is gathering information about the processes at a healthcare facility before we change the process. This is particularly important in healthcare where errors and process problems can harm people. This unit is about knowledge acquisition, an early and necessary step in process improvement. Blaine Lee, Ph.D., was a founding vice president of Covey Leadership Center and a contributing author to books by Stephen R. Covey and Norman Vincent Peale. Lecture A covers background for knowledge acquisition, K.A. The topics covered in this lecture include Knowledge Acquisition, K.A., Goals in Healthcare, Importance of K.A., Categories of Knowledge, and Knowledge and the Capability Maturity Model, CMM. The goal of knowledge acquisition for healthcare process analysis and redesign is to elicit and document workflow information about a clinical practice so that technology can be leveraged and patient care can ultimately be improved. Knowledge acquisition, also called KA, is the way that we gain a thorough and accurate understanding of the present state. Knowledge acquisition is a necessary step that allows us to identify salient workflow issues. For example, which processes are the most important? Which are the high volume processes? Which processes will present the greatest challenge to implementation of HIT? Which processes will need to be revised? Which processes will disappear? Clinicians and IT professionals have different expertise. However, in order to make computers and information systems effective in clinical settings, knowledge from these two disciplines must be combined or integrated. The knowledge gap between these disciplines is often filled by a health informaticist or a health IT professional. We'll call this individual an analyst. Either the analyst can work with clinicians and practice staff to understand their workflow, or the analyst can train and facilitate practice staff in doing part of this work. Methodology for the latter is covered in a separate unit. This unit focuses on methodology for an analyst to gather information and document clinic processes, such that appropriate technology can be leveraged to improve clinic processes and ultimately patient care. Knowledge acquisition means what you would think from everyday use of the words, gathering and capturing knowledge. Knowledge acquisition is a broad term, i.e., it is used in many other disciplines. Management science, computer science, artificial intelligence, and cognitive psychology. There is no one definitive method. Further, methods are customized for particular disciplines and for the level of detail needed. As Aristotle wrote, it is the mark of an instructed mind to rest satisfied with the degree of precision which the nature of the subject admits and not to seek exactness when only an approximation of the truth is possible. What he meant was that it is a bad idea to do a more detailed analysis than what is required to accomplish your goal. Simply put, too much detail wastes time and other resources. Therefore, we present here a method that is focused on health care and matching health IT to clinic processes, and is only as detailed as necessary. Brian Gaines, a recognized knowledge acquisition expert from the University of Calgary, conducted a research project where he worked with managers involved in an ongoing project on knowledge modeling of manufacturing processes in small companies. This provided us with a concept map, reproduced here from Gaines' research report, of the routine ways in which organizations acquire knowledge, i.e., the universe and scope of organizational knowledge acquisition. Gains N.D. Several of these methods are applicable to our work in health IT adoption and clinic process improvement. 
For example, the clinics who hire process analysts and redesign specialists or who receive this expertise through their regional extension center are recruiting people with expertise and gathering advice from consultants. Professional process analysts routinely gather advice from professional literature through conferences and reading trade and scientific journals. Some of the regional extension centers are establishing local support groups that give clinic leadership and staff the opportunity to participate in communities of practice. When clinics approach a regional extension center, they are contracting with other organizations. Through working with the regional extension centers, clinics are engaging in process improvement through experience in use. Process improvement through process analysis and process improvement through purchase of technology. This and related units teach methodology for process improvement through process analysis and process improvement through purchase of technology, GAINS ND. Without spending too much time on theory related to knowledge and knowledge acquisition, and there is a lot of it, we present two important concepts in this and the next slides. Seven aspects of knowledge are given. The important thing to understand is that knowledge is what we call a multidimensional concept. That is, there are different aspects. Gaines' work does not provide definitions for each of the dimensions. However, we can explain them by example. Let's look first at internal versus external knowledge. Some knowledge is internal to us or in our minds, while other knowledge is external or in the world. When we use a GPS while driving, it is usually because we do not know the way, or maybe the quickest way. Thus, we do not have internal knowledge, and we rely on the external knowledge that resides in the GPS system, GAINS ND. Knowledge can also be classified as coded or tacit, GAINS ND. Tacit knowledge is knowledge that individuals have that is difficult to transfer. When we hire a senior craftsman or performing artist, they are special because they can do something in a way that no one else can. In cases like this, their knowledge that enables them to such unique and expert performance is innate. It is not written down. There is no step-by-step -step process that one can follow. In fact, such experts often cannot articulate the knowledge that is the core of their expertise. This is tacit knowledge. Coded, also called explicit knowledge on the other hand, is knowledge that is written down in step-by-step -step manner, such that others can use and apply it. In clinical practices, there is a lot of tacit knowledge, and part of the job of an analyst acquiring knowledge is to take in this knowledge, document it in writing or diagrams, i.e., turn it into coded knowledge and thus make it explicit. Still, others have made the distinction between active and passive knowledge in the way that knowledge is used by the knower. Active knowledge is something that is used by the knower to do something. For example, nurses use their knowledge every day to take care of patients. Passive knowledge is different. It is knowledge or experience that is encoded by the knower, but not in actual use. In passive knowledge, the knower is not applying the knowledge. Gains and D. Another way to look at knowledge is whether the knowledge has been or is best learned through transmission, i.e., taught or read, or whether the knowledge is experiential, i.e., learned by doing. Probably the most widely used dimension is declarative versus procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge is the knowledge of facts, i.e., properties between things and concepts and the relationships between them. Procedural knowledge, on the other hand, is the knowledge of how to do something. Milton, 2007. A standard operating procedure is an example of coded procedural knowledge. A recipe has aspects of both declarative and procedural knowledge. The ingredients list is declarative knowledge, whereas the statements about the sequence of mixing and procedure for cooking are procedural knowledge. Gaines and others have described other aspects of knowledge that are, for example, properties of an organization's intent for acquiring the knowledge or how it will be used. But these are not properties of the actual knowledge and are less important for our work here. The 2x2 two two diagram adapted from Gaines shows the relationship between passive, active, tacit, 
coded, sticky, transmittable, and declarative and procedural knowledge. A third dimension was added to this framework, declarative and procedural knowledge. In the left upper quadrant is experience. Experience is both passive and tacit knowledge. Through science or reflective learning, tacit knowledge can be acquired and captured in coded form. Coded knowledge is in the right upper quadrant. Coding tacit knowledge creates information, i.e., facts, declarative knowledge. Creation of coded knowledge adds immense value because then the knowledge is accessible to others. For example, where an organization has coded knowledge, that knowledge resides with the organization and provides consistency of performance rather than residing and leaving with individuals. Where knowledge resides with individuals rather than the organization, organizations are not in control of their consistency and ultimately quality and performance. Coded knowledge is transmittable, manageable, and shareable. Importantly, active coded knowledge, lower right quadrant, is coded knowledge in action, i.e., know-how that can be transmitted to others. Moving back to the left, in the lower left quadrant, lies skill. Skill is tacit, active knowledge. It is the alternative to coded knowledge. Skill is sticky knowledge, i.e., it comes and leaves with individuals. Through its immense amount of contracting experience and prompted by contracting for software, the United States government realized the need to be able to assess an organization's likelihood to consistently deliver a quality product on time. This is described by the Capability Maturity Model, initially developed by the Software Engineering Institute, SEI, at Carnegie Mellon University. The Capability Maturity Model, CMM, was developed through a U.S. Department of Defense-funded research project, where data was collected from organizations that contracted with the U.S. Department of Defense. At its heart, the Capability Maturity Model describes five levels of increasing codification and institutional management of knowledge. The uppermost, fifth level, is an ideal state where processes are systematically managed by a combination of process optimization and continuous process improvement. The CMM or CMMI model is important to have a feel for because as an analyst, you will encounter clinics at all levels of process maturity. Your job will differ depending on the CMM level at which the clinic operates. For example, if you find an organization at a lower level, much of your time will be spent eliciting tacit knowledge and helping the clinic leadership and staff codify it. The knowledge acquisition and process analysis phase will take longer where this is the case. Alternatively, when you encounter a clinic at the higher levels, there will be existing documentation of clinic processes that you can use as a source, and your acquisition and analysis phase will be shorter. When you encounter a clinic at level 5, your work as a process analyst may fit into their existing process improvement framework as part of their continuous improvement. There are five levels of the capability maturity model. Level 1. Initial. Chaotic. It is characteristic of processes at this level that they are typically undocumented and in a state of dynamic change, tending to be driven in an ad hoc, uncontrolled, and reactive manner by users or events. This provides a chaotic or unstable environment for the processes. Level 2. Repeatable. It is characteristic of processes at this level that some processes are repeatable, possibly with consistent results. Process discipline is unlikely to be rigorous, but where it exists, it may help to ensure that existing processes are maintained during times of stress. Level 3. Defined. It is characteristic of processes at this level that there are sets of defined and documented standard processes established and subject to some degree of improvement over time. These standard processes are in place, i.e., they are the as-is processes and used to establish consistency of process performance across the organization. Level 4. Managed. It is characteristic of processes at this level that using process metrics management can effectively control the as-is process, for example, for software development. 
In particular, management can identify ways to adjust and adapt the process to particular projects without measurable losses of quality or deviations from specifications. Process capability is established from this level. Level 5. Optimized. It is a characteristic of processes at this level that the focus is on continually improving process performance through both incremental and innovative technological changes improvements. This concludes Lecture A of Acquiring Clinical Process Knowledge. Lecture A covered background principles relevant to knowledge acquisition, including Knowledge Acquisition Goals in Healthcare, Importance of Knowledge Acquisition, Categories of Knowledge, and Knowledge and the Capability Maturity Model, CMM.